Home and Health. Sharmila. Good morning, everyone. I would like to first thank the Academy and uh, Professor Parthu Majumdar for inviting me for giving this talk. What I'm going to do is that before I talk about the gut microbiome, um, uh, I, I'll give a brief on the gut microbiome. Although Professor uh, Partha has already uh, introduced the topic of the microbiome. Uh, and before I go into the gut microbiome, uh, I'll talk about a little bit of, of the challenges in analyzing the microbiome data, because that's really, really important, and go over some of the work which we have done uh, in the gut microbiome. Um, so this okay, now I think it's working. Yeah, okay. Uh, sorry about that. So, um, uh, so they, they play me, uh, several roles in the body. Uh, so, uh, in the last couple of years, what has come out is that people have shown that if there are aberrations in the gut microflora or the gut microbiome, they can lead to various diseases and disorders. One can think of obesity, enteric diseases, uh, type 2 diabetes to be associated with gut microbiome. But things like the brain behavior or the atherosclerosis, liver cirrhosis, these have been linked to the aberrations in the gut. So that's really interesting. And uh, so what is really important is to understand uh, the link between the correlation between what is there in the gut and the different diseases and disorders. And that's what we are trying to, uh, um, uh, trying to understand. Now, uh, before I go into the gut microbiome, let me uh, just uh, quickly talk about, you know, uh, what are the challenges in analyzing uh, the microbiome data, whether it is gut microbiome, skin microbiome, or, or any other microbiome. Uh, this is the protocol which is used, which is called as the metagenomics uh, workflow. Uh, you, take the, uh, DA, uh, you take the sample from any environment. So in my case, uh, we are talking about the gut microbiome. So we are talking, taking the stool samples. Uh, which will be represent from the stool samples. We extract all the DNA from that. So that is the bacterial DNA or the microbial DNA. Uh, extract the DNA out and the sequence, you, you, uh, you do the sequencing using the next generation sequencing platforms. And what comes out from there are the sequenced fragments. That means the fragments, if there are say three DNA, this is a representation, uh, then you will get sequence fragments from these three different uh, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the organism's DNA. Uh, and uh, as uh, Professor Partha already mentioned, that this majority of these microbes are also not known. Uh, they are not culturable, most of them. So uh, almost uh, uh, about 1 to 10 percent of the microbes are known they are, they are there in the database. And uh, majority of the 90 to 99 percent are unknown. So, uh, uh, so you can imagine, so if you, uh, if you have to analyze this data, so what comes out? So sequencing is the simplest part. So once the data comes out is what then we have to analyze and whatever results which, which uh, we get will depend on answering these three questions. The three questions which we ask and we try to uh, understand computational are what are the micros which are there and what are their relative proportions. We just, just uh, saw that you know there are changes between two the ethnic group for example. Uh, what are what are what are the which microbes are there and what are their relative proportions? What functional genes do they have and how do they function? Because these microbes they don't they do not play indiv in, in, in individual uh, way. So these three uh, we want to un uh, understand. And the challenge in doing this, I'll just give two of those challenges. One of these, say, if you have to answer this question of what microbes are there and what is their what are their relative proportions? So this is what we have the sequence data. And the sequence data will have, I mean, each of these fragments will be of the length anywhere between 100 to 500 base pair or the characters, okay. And what we really want to do is if you want to answer this question, we have to bucket this into different uh, buckets in order to say that there are three organisms in this particular one. Now the question, the, the problem is if, you, if I would have known all the sequences of all the three organisms, the genome sequences of all these, uh, then it would have been easier than I would have mapped each of these and say that, you know, bucket these groups of, uh, you know, the, 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 the one type uh, in, uh, in one bucket, the second one in the second and third. But the challenge is that because only one percent is known in the database, so you will end up, you know, searching in this known sequence database for this. Uh, but all other ones you will not be able to assign it uh, using this particular approach that is the mapping onto a genome. Uh, and the next complication is that when I say it is unknown that is 1 to 10 percent unknown they can be unknown at different levels. It can be a completely new species or a species which belongs to a, so this is the hierarchy of 
the taxonomy. Uh, the species belong to certain species belong to a genus, certain genera uh, belong to a family and so on. This is the taxonomy. So if I have to uh, uh, map each of these, I have to map it at the appropriate level. It might be a completely different, you know, uh, a new species belonging to a complete different phylum or it could uh, belong to a new class and so on. So the assignment of each of these into bucket at appropriate level is absolutely necessary. And this calls for the, the uh, you know, algorithms which can, uh, which can assign each of these reads at uh, accurately at appropriate level uh, and quickly. Um, the second the question which we, this is another challenge, what functional genes do they have? As I mentioned that this sequence is what you what we get out of, out of the sequencing machines, they are about 100 to 500 or 600 base pair long. Uh, so you cannot identify the genes from these each of these uh, fragments. So you have to assemble them into what is called as the context. So, uh, so, so what will happen if I try to assemble all the uh, based on these sequences, you might get chimera, you might get chimera from one uh, coming from one bacteria uh, with the other one. How do you make sure that they are coming from the same organism and so on, that's, that's one of the challenge which we have. So assembly is another, it's like a, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, if you have multiple jigsaw puzzles in multiple numbers, how do you assemble them together and put them together and say that, you know, these uh, pieces belong to one uh, uh, organism and so on. And then based on that, you can do the functional characterization. Um, th the next one is how do they function, so, uh, things like, again, the challenges here is that uh, we're looking into the interactions between these organisms amongst these organisms, key or microbial groups which are responsible in any particular environment. Uh, if you are looking into two different uh, sets of um, uh, microbiome data, one with the disease and another with the completely healthy, uh, uh, can you find out a specific marker sequences or marker organisms which are there only in the, in only in the disease one and which are not there in the healthy. Uh, so these are some of the things which one needs to uh, uh, answer. Uh, to get the uh, final answer uh, uh, of the microbiome. So what my group has been doing over the last uh, 10 years or so, I mean one, when we started in 2006, we started developing algorithms. So these are all the algorithms what, what we have mentioned uh, uh, here in different colors here. Uh, these are the different steps and these are the algorithms what we have developed over the years uh, and these are all published and patented um, uh, algorithms what we have. Uh, and we have created an end-to-end -end analysis platform. We have an end-to-end -end analysis platform given any microbiome data then we can do step by step and then using these algorithms it can analyze the entire microbiome data. Uh, one another uh, challenge is that now with the growing microbiome data, uh, one concern is that how do you uh, compress this data because the usual compression techniques uh, are not uh, good enough for when the data becomes really large is again uh, another thing which we have worked on and we also have some uh, for compression and archival of the data microbiome data which uh, we have which, which holds for the genomic data also uh, which we have come up with. Now I have come back, I will come back to the now uh, the, the gut microbiome part which I started with. So this is, uh, this is just the gut microbiome, um, uh, this, this has been shown that when the baby, before the baby is born, uh, the gut micro, there is no gut microbiome, it's sterile basically, the gut is sterile. But when the baby is born, depending on whether the baby is born uh, C-section or normal, uh, uh, the gut microbiome differs and that has been shown in the literature. And uh, uh, if you just forget about, you know, what, what my bacterial groups which I have mentioned here, uh, just notice in this pie charts the colors, you see the over the, uh, over the lifespan, uh, it has been shown that the, uh, these, uh, the types of bacterial groups which are there in the gut microbiome also changes. For example, if the formula fed versus the breastfed babies are very different, uh, if you look into the microbial component, the toddler depending on healthy and malnutrition, I will talk about this one in a little while. The adult one versus the elderly one also, there are certain groups of bacteria which becomes more and certain groups which disappear over, over the time frame. So the question which we asked uh, is that, you know, what constitutes a healthy gut microbiome is the question which we asked. And what we did was, because this was way back into about uh, uh, five, six years back, uh, we said that that was the first time we wanted to study the microbiome uh, data because we, I had only worked on the uh, algorithms. 
so what we did uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. G. B. Nair is that we, we looked into two, the guts of two uh, children. One was severely malnourished and another was absolutely healthy. And these two children were from a slum area in West Bengal. And uh, um, why did we check the uh, why did we take the severely malnourished? The reason being that because the malnourishment is one of the major problems in India below the age of five. This is the statistics, which is the if you look into the low birth weight or overweight or stunting, wasting all these. India actually is the highest amongst all countries. So that's why we started looking into that. So when we looked into these two children, uh, one severely malnourished, other one uh, absolutely healthy, what came out from this study was that we looked at, uh, so when we uh, see the uh, healthy, in, uh, healthy, you know, the gut microflora in the healthy uh, child, we saw most of them were helpful bacteria or the commensal bacteria. Uh, but there were few pathogens, it's not that the pathogens were not there, there were pathogens in the normal child. But what was striking was in the malnourished child, there were majority of them were, uh, were pathogens uh, uh, which were found. And then also we found some, uh, the, uh, the groups of, you know, the functional groups which were present, which, uh, uh, which could give us the hint that, you know, because of which the malnourished child was not able to uh, um, um, uh, absorb the food uh, in that. So what came out from this particular study was that you know the, there is there were infections in the intestinal epithelium uh, uh, by the gastrointestinal pathogens. But um, and then uh, but definitely the pathogens uh, were normally these pathogens were found in no, normally not found in the in the uh, adult uh, or in the healthy individuals. Going forward, what we did was that uh, since we realized that there was a difference between the healthy and the severely malnourished, we went into a longer uh, one. I mean, we took a, a larger set of uh, um, children this time. And uh, this time again, we took from the West Bengal area, but uh, from a village, not from a, uh, not from a slum. Uh, and then we took the children with varying nutritional status. What I mean by that was at one end I had, uh, we had one severely malnourished child and at the other end we had absolutely healthy. So there was a spectrum of children which were considered in this particular study to look into whether there was any link between the nutritional status and the kind of gut bacteria which were present in those children. And uh, what we really uh, looked into was we looked into the, uh, uh, the nutritional status we uh, checked with respect to three uh, characteristics, height for age, weight for age and weight for height. These are the three which are recommended by WHO and this is based on this. We uh, characterize one person, I mean each individual uh, um, uh, whether it was malnourished or borderline or healthy. And we looked into the uh, correlation between the taxonomic groups and the functional uh, groups which were present in each of these children. So what came out from this particular study was that we, if we, so this is the healthiest child, this one, and this one is the, uh, the severely malnourished child. This is the spectrum. So we call it that this is absolutely healthy uh, section. This is the borderline, and this is the severely malnourished. And if we look into this from this heat map, what came out was that there was this group of bacteria, this, this particular cluster, which we call as the G1. If you, uh, if you remember that G1 is for, because I'm going to come back on that, G1 is the good bacteria which are present, which are positively correlated with the nutritional status or with the health status. And this particular group called the G4, these are the bad bacteria, these ones uh, are negatively correlated with the, uh, with the uh, nutritional status. So what, uh, so the, this, I mean, uh, the, this is not clear, but what came out was this, this G1 we call as the healthy marker. And they have uh, things like Roseberia, Mitsukela, Fecalobacterium. These are known to be no, uh, from the literature, probiotic or anti-inflammatory genera. Um, also certain bacterial groups which were found in this particular group, uh, they also are known to harvest energy from the dietary fiber. So these are these we call these as H1 G1 group is called as the healthy biomarker, whereas this group uh, has uh, more potentially pathogenic pathogenic bacteria, Shigella, E. coli, Streptococcus, and so on. So this we call as the malnourished uh, uh, marker in this particular case. Now uh, it's the we also found out some uh, something in the uh, um, the functional ones also. So we also wanted to look into the community because they are not these pathogens or the uh, commensals are not there by themselves. They are interacting with each other and then giving whatever phenotype uh, they have. Uh, so what we looked into was that if you look into this is the apparently healthy and uh, as, as uh, I mentioned G1 is the good bacteria. So there are 
G4 that is the bad bacterial group is associated with uh, in these two uh, groups which are interacting with the G1 uh, in, in the apparently healthy. So, there are G4 groups in the apparently healthy uh, uh, also interacting with the, uh, uh, the good bacteria. And what we see in frequentosis is the exactly the same thing what I showed in the previous one, but if you go into the border line, you can see that the G4 members they start associating with each other. So, this G4 member has gone and associated with the other G4, this G4 and some other G4 members and slowly the G1 members they come out in the borderline case. And in case of the uh, severe demolish, what comes out is that again these members from these three groups they uh, join together and there is a clear one group with G1 and one group in the G4 and what really come, came out from this study was that, uh, that there are two really uh, two, two groups of armies or two groups which were present and but this dominated in the severely malnourished case uh, in case of uh, uh, in the severely malnourished over the, the healthy one. So, this uh, ha having seen this then we wanted uh, so uh, we saw that there are distinct differences between the microbial groups which are there in the in these children and the nutritional status. We went ahead and what we are doing right now is uh, uh, this is yet not published, but what we have done is now we have taken 170 uh, severely malnourished uh, children there from the Delhi area and we have given uh, the what is called as the ready to use therapeutic food called RUTF which is recommended by WHO and some more uh, additional food supplements which were given and we monitored the, these children for a period of 6 weeks. And we see that lot of children they become healthier go towards the better nutritional status, but there are quite a few children who do not become as healthy as uh, uh, we would have expected. And we look back, when we look back, we see that, that the disbiases in the gut microfilm in those children were so bad that uh, it would need a much longer uh, you know, uh, duration of these food supplements to be given in order for the good bacteria to, uh, um, uh, to, 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 to come into the gut microbiome of those severe, severely malnourished uh, children. And this actually leads to the prospect for the development of the new probiotics and uh, nutraceuticals. Um, so, this was about the children what I was talking about. So, how about the adult gut micro microbiome is that different from the children because we looked into all the children around uh, the age of 5 or below. Uh, so, there are in the adult uh, um, uh, there are uh, so many things which uh, it depends on Professor Parth has already mentioned that lifestyle ethnicity depends on those, but there are also other things that the gut microbiome play important role in the drug when we, dr we use the drug whether they get metabolized uh, uh, in the drug uh, in the metabolized in the how they get metabolized. The antibiotic is another one which I will talk about in a little while. Um, so, what we um, so in order to understand uh, now uh, the, the uh, adult gut. Um, uh, if we have to do it in the in the urban areas, then uh, there are so many variations. So we wanted to, to reduce the variations in these, and we said that we'll start with the uh, tribal groups. So in India, what we did was that we uh, uh, did uh, uh, the tribal group, the 193 individuals, which we took from 15 ethnic groups in four geographies in Assam, Telangana, Sikkim, and Manipur. And this was work was done with uh, uh, Dr. Mujibur Khan and uh, um, uh, Dr. Talukdar from IISST uh, in Guwahati. And what we found from this one was the so these are these are the different uh, groups which were considered uh, in this one uh, 15 ethnic groups and four geographies is what is depicted here. And also we compared with the tribal data which are available and which are uh, which 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 are from the different uh, geographies which are indicated here. And when we compare with those and we find that our tribal uh, gut community the gut microbiome of the Indian tribe were very similar to the Mongolian ones. That was the closest one which we found that is one of the things which we found uh, from our studies. So, this clearly indicated that there are differences of course, we found several other things, but I will not go into details, but it is interesting that they, they were uh, closer to the Mongolian what we found in this particular study. The other things uh, which I just mentioned that you know in the adult gut because we uh, when we take antibiotics some of us uh, respond to certain antibiotics some of us are not. Uh, uh, so, because we take these antibiotics orally uh, they go to the gastrointestinal tract to the uh, so they do have uh, you know the gut microbiome do play important role and that is something which we try to look into I will show you some some of the work 
and also the xenobiotics that uh, are uh, there are uh, we are export, exposed to so many xenobiotics. Uh, so, what uh, um, uh, the xenobiotic metabolism is again one component which uh, uh, which we looked into in the gut micro uh, in the gut microbiome because all the drugs which we take orally. Uh, are the uh, you know the, the, the xenobiotics are basically the precursors of these drug molecules. So we looked into that, and when when we looked into this was this was just published last month, and uh, this we looked into from the publicly available data, and uh, um, also the Indian ones were our uh, our work, and uh, we took about 400 close to 400 individual from eight geographies. And what clearly shows in this particular one is if you look into the geography wise, this is uh, 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 with geography, the xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes which are produced by these bacterial groups, they vary across the geographies. And one striking one was the Spanish data which, which, which had a larger xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes. And we also, some of these countries had the drug usage pattern and we looked into the drug usage pattern, it actually matched with uh, our finding that the larger the drug usage you have a larger uh, uh, dividing metabolizing capability. With age we also looked into because we had the data set from different age groups we saw that the with from 0 to 10 years of age I mean the from birth to 10 years the xenobiting metabolism was very very low the uh, by bacteria harboring those but they increase over time which is probably because uh, the ex exposure to wide range of drugs or and, uh, the xenobiotics with age probably is leading to the increase in the xenobiotics. Uh, over uh, over time. So this one, I just want to highlight this because uh, this is really relevant. The uh, antibiotic resistance when we talk about the adult gut. Uh, so here we uh, this was uh, slightly old. So we had only 275 individuals which we could get. This was all publicly available data, and we looked into the resistance to 240 antibiotics um, uh, because uh, this uh, uh, and then we looked into the how many antibiotics against which they are resistant to and how many what is the uh, number of uh, genes which are harbor this and this is the statistics what we got uh, we see that out of 240 antibiotics which uh, we uh, checked we found uh, um, the genes conferring resistance only to the 53 antibiotics um, uh, in this and some of them like for example tetracycline and bacitration was found almost in all individuals which we uh, looked at and that was not surprising because tetracycline has been widely used uh, uh, worldwide and uh, they followed by vancomycin and we also found out which are the bacterial groups which uh, harbor these bacterial uh, uh, these uh, antibiotic resistant genes this is the pattern of the country specific antibiotic resistance so americans had so these are the these are the uh, two cephalosporin and phosmidomycin are the two drugs which are uh, which are uh, really high in the um, uh, the antibiotic resistance uh, to which is observed in the American Spanish was very different. Uh, this is the uh, the antibiotic against which the, we found. But the Chinese was the very striking one, where we found that the antibiotics uh, uh, to which they are resistant to was very very different from rest of the world, and the the genes which. Uh, are, uh, which harbor these antibiotic, uh, uh, the, the um, microbes which are harbor these antibiotic resistant genes and the genes which have this are very distinct in these Chinese ones and uh, p p I'm sure the Indian ones also will be quite uh, distinct from rest of the world. When we looked into, when we looked, so each of these points what we I have is the profile, the each individual with a profile of uh, the antibiotics against which it is resistant to. So if, the, if I group these individual based on the resistance profile, then I get two different distinct clusters, one completely uh, where, where uh, all the Chinese belong to and other one is a mixed one. If I actually uh, resolve this then I get three. So basically I have four clusters, one which is uh, completely Chinese, one which is preferred in the European and Japanese, other one uh, mostly in the US and the fourth one is completely, uh, 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 I mean it is a mix of all, of all of these. And this we call is that resistor type. So based on, so we can look into each individual and will fall into one of the four resistor types that is the resistance to uh, uh, giving the idea of which resistance, uh, uh, the which, which uh, um, antibiotics we are resistant to. So, uh, the, so this is my concluding style uh, slide what we basically what I just said uh, whether it is the chil uh, children gut or the adult gut. Uh, we all are looking into the stool samples and uh, uh, if we can analyze this gut microbiome that is based on the stool sample, uh, one should be able to uh, identify the disease or the antibiotic resistant patterns and so on. 
and uh, um, eventually it's going to lead to personalized therapies or probiotics and nutraceutical and uh, uh, people have already started working towards altering the gut microbiome because we anyway cannot alter our genome. Uh, can we alter the gut microbiome as people uh, have also uh, people have started in one of the cases like uh, in US it has been practiced for the Clostridium difficile infection. They do what is called as a fecal transplant and it has saved uh, uh, lives of a lot of these people. And uh, uh, we can think of you know based on the gut microbiome one can think of the microbiome formulations or the cocktail which can be used as a. Uh, you know, uh, 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 probiotics or nutraceutical, the cocktail which can be used as a personalized th therapeutics and we probably will come up with uh, novel tar targets in these. What, what is important in this is what I, uh, what I put in here is the analytics platform because th each of the algorithms what you use for analyzing micro microbiome is very, very critical. Uh, because if you make, you know, if, if the analysis is not correct, we might predict, you know, certain things. If, uh, if it is a wrong species, for example, if you say that it's a pathogen, and you treat for that particular pathogen, that's going to be a really, uh, I mean, this is just an example. So it is very important to have an analytic platform which has the accuracy and the uh, and the speed at which one can, you know, analyze this data is very very important. So uh, uh, this is uh, this forms a crucial component in this microbiome. Uh, so, I finally would like to thank uh, my team, uh, this is not uh, all I think few are missing in this and I have lots of collaborators uh, uh, for the work which I just presented on the malnourishment I started uh, with uh, uh, NICET Kolkata with uh, uh, Professor uh, Dr. G. Binair uh, who moved to THST, I still continue uh, collaborating with him uh, for the um, tribal work. Uh, with IISST with Mujibur and uh, uh, Dr. Talukdar. Uh, um, I also have project which is going on actually we, uh, I did not present anything on the type 2 diabetes, gut microbiome type 2 diabetes with Dr. Uh, Dr. Mohan from uh, Madras Diabetic Research Foundation and Dr. Uluf Pedersen from Copenhagen, uh, Copenhagen University. Uh, and Dr. G.B. Nair, uh, that is at the uh, diabetes project. Uh, with doc with doc uh, Dr. Philip Abraham, I am uh, working on the, um, in the, um, uh, with the stomach microbiome. So that was missed out in this. We do find some interesting findings in the stomach microbiome, uh, uh, which we are doing with the Hinduja hospital. And uh, we did some work on the skin microbiome with uh, Dr. Rajesh Gokhale from IGIB. And I uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>